Good afternoon. Welcome to the October meeting of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society. My name is Jonathan Stair and I'm the president. Glad to see all of you here today. Anybody here for the very first time, never been with us before. All right. We'd like you to give us your name, where you're from, and what your research interests are. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Dettinger. I'm from the Fort Grace. My name is Raul Hauser. And uh, looking at the Glosser, Raul Hauser, Dettinger families. Okay. Sir? Uh, my name is Bill Mono. I live in Nottingham, Maryland currently, and I run a YouTube channel, and then I work for a grant, and I get sent to historic sites all over the country to make YouTube videos and promote historic sites, and I was sent here today, and here I am. Excellent. Well, Scott will be a very good person to get the video, trust me. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, uh, Mike McAdams, and uh, first time for any lecture, but been here way in the past for some family research and just trying to get back here today again. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. At this time, uh, we'll have Richard Robinstein read the minutes from uh, last meeting. Thank you. More, or after you ever watch. Uh, Jonathan Stair, president of Society, began opening the meeting. Uh, with the York History Center, there were three new attendees, just like at this time. Um, and Jonathan asked where they were from and what they were in researching as well. I read the left minutes of last month, the month before June 11, 2023. Those notes were approved and will be filed accordingly. The June and July treasury reports were given by Margaret Burke. Uh, those were also approved and they will be filed. And for future reference, membership stands at 104, five new members. 35 members have not been renewed. Uh, this year, if new this year will be your membership number and membership expiration or your newsletter for those that are male. And uh, they also will have, if you're getting anything online, it'll be up in your subject matter as to your when your your membership expires uh, your county history center director of archive nicole spotlight any uh up, spotlight upcoming events and activities scheduled for the month the session uh, is being recorded on youtube president uh, Jonathan stair advised that there was an exhibit on general uh, general jacob devers as well as other World War II memorial um, in the state archive is roughly over 50% moved in. So they're on track for late October, early November opening. And Vice President Richard Pumper will be a list of upcoming events. Thank you. Margaret? Got my exercise and <laughs> climbing over the course. Okay, the treasurer's report for August, September 2023. I combined it. Uh, balanced at August 1st, 2023 was $16,651.22. Receipts. There were no receipts in August, but the in September we had membership renewals of $145. So the total receipts for the two months, $145. Disbursements we had in June the speaker fee of $125. In August, the uh, post office box renewal for one year, $354. Postal connections for the July August newsletter, $181.53. The September speaker fee of $125. So total disbursements for both months, $660.53. The cash balance as of September 30th, 2023, $16,010.66, excuse me, 69 cents. And uh, for membership, uh, as of October 1st, we have 114 memberships. 
Of those 114 memberships, life members, uh, 19, and families, five. Uh, the um, for the year we have nine new members, and this is from uh, June, uh, Jan July first, and um, renewals. We had uh, five uh, didn't renew before, but they did this month. They had five, and uh, we have a couple that have said they are sending the money in. So that's that. Good. Adam, anything from the district center? Sure. Uh, just some upcoming events. So I think you're going to talk about Oyster Fest, so I won't talk about that. Um, but that's in two weeks. Anyway, um, before that, on second Saturday, October 14th, um, in this building, we're welcoming Charles Stanbaugh in to do a second Saturday talk. Uh, Charles is going to be talking about the birth and death of Hanover's Forest Park, which was a trolley park basically built to encourage use of the trolley system in Hanover. Um, then on October 18th, um, we're welcoming back Scott Mingus, <laughs> who's here almost constantly sometimes, uh, but maybe he feels that way, I don't know. Uh, but he'll be presenting for the York Civil War Roundtable on October 18th at 7 o'clock p.m., uh, again in this room. And he'll be presenting um, a lecture kind of based on his brand new book, Did You Fight the Many? Hanover, Pennsylvania in the Civil War. So that's on October 18th. Um, the following night, October 19th, there's a new event that I'm not really sure exactly what the focus of it is, but it's something coming from the visitor experience side. Um, wander in the Woods, and uh, this will be a talk between 6.30 and 8 o'clock p.m. Rissa Miller will be presenting Meet Pennsylvania's Cryptids. Uh, if you're not familiar, cryptids are mythical creatures that live in Pennsylvania's wilderness. I only recently discovered these things, which is weird because uh, Halloween is one of my favorite holidays. Anyway, uh, but Rissa Miller will be here to talk about uh, the kind of creatures you might find in the woods and creeks and ponds of Pennsylvania. And then finally, on uh, October 25th, Wednesday, October 25th at 7 p.m., um, Vietnam veteran Chu Lee will be discussing his experiences as one of the last helicopter pilots to leave Vietnam for the end of the war. Those are upcoming events. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Before I have Richard come and talk about our upcoming programs, just want to mention a few things. If you are not a member of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society and or not a member of the York County History Center, I encourage you to join both of them. We have some membership brochures over on the table there. The History Center has this facility and the new facility, which is depicted by the layout over there. And the genealogical site provides these programs, and we also publish special publications as well. One of the projects of the History Center is an annual journal. And this just came out last week, it has some very interesting articles, particularly related to some military topics, World War I, um, some other things in here, Civil War, and so forth, Brickyard. Uh, so there's an article on women and advocacy in York County. So take a look at that. But the reason I'm holding this up is because this brought to my attention that one of our members is does not receive the uh, recognition that she deserves. And Becky, if you'd raise your hand, I found out through reading this that Becky has contributed as many articles as a single person has, except I think for our speaker, Scott Mingus. I think Scott and Becky both have contributed four articles over the history of this journal. And we should, I, I think that we should celebrate what Becky has done. So let's give Becky a round of applause. She's way too modest. She won't tell you about that. That's why I'm too her. for her. So um, some of you may be aware of my quest to get a copy of my original birth certificate. After getting a court order, and pay another $20, I finally got a copy of it right there. 
So if you are acquainted with our legislators, you might our state legislators, you might want to put a bug in their ear that the law needs to change so that the Department of Health sends you the copy of the original instead of something that their office transcribes, which is not an original birth certificate. It is a transcription, which I haven't been able to get them to understand that in my communications with them. But so I'm happy about that. It was mentioned about the state archives. I was up there this week and I was told either this week or early next week, they'll be finished moving the materials. They're going to be having boot camp for the staff to acquaint them with the new building and train them to how, how the new policies and so forth. And they're shooting to be open. The state archivist said before Thanksgiving, but really about the second week of November is what, the, what they're shooting for. So, um, Stay tuned. If that's it, they're, everything goes right. But it seemed like things were moving pretty well up there. I was quite impressed, quite actually, actually, with how well things were moving. So Adam mentioned the Oyster Festival. The York County History Center will be sponsoring the Oyster Festival down at the Agricultural Industrial Museum on West Princess Street. Our organization will have a table there. The solar officers will be staffing that table. You're welcome to join us. We're welcome to stop by. You're certainly welcome to come and participate partake of oysters and the other goodies that they have down there. Uh, if you've never been to the Oyster Festival, I don't know how to describe it, except it's uh, an indoor extravaganza of food and activities. And of course, you can tour the museum. So uh, come on down. That's in two weeks, October the 15th. Are there any yes. I should suggest just uh, something I wanted to say. If you're interested in getting oysters, I'd suggest getting there early. Yeah, they ran out last year. So uh, I've been told, though, that there, the, there's better planning this year. So we'll see how, how that works. Also, lots of Also, lots of oysters. But if you don't like oysters, they also, uh, I think it's going to be back again, had a pit beef, I think it was. Shrimp. Was it shrimp? And the is it the uh, one? It's the auxiliary or whatever they called of the right. the French right. Street Center had a big bank sale type place, and they they sold all their big goods as well. I went over for something later in the day, and it was completely cleaned out. But they always have very uh, delicious looking things, and there's other things like hot dogs, other snacky things you can pick up. But and they have uh, music, different activities, some things for children, all kinds of stuff going on all afternoon. So it starts at 11 o'clock and runs till four o'clock on October the 15th. Is there any other news anybody else has you'd like to share with the group? All right, if not, I'm gonna ask our Vice President Richard Punkel to come tell us about future programs and introduce our speaker. Speaker next month is yours truly. That will be on November the 5th in this room. Um, my topic will be um, accusations and um, defense against um, accusations of witchcraft of Katarina Ziegler of the Doris Township. It's a newspaper article I found quite by happenstance, some pretty unusual things about 100 years before the Hex trial. This lady was accused of witchcraft and gave a very strong defense that she was not a witch. She may have been a powwow. Um, we have no meeting in December. In January, it is a show and tell sort of meeting. You come and if you have a story to tell or if you have an item. Um, last year, I think I brought a mincemeat pie so it can be something people can eat. Just don't poison anyone. Um, so, you know, it can be anything that's genealogically or related to your family or some kind of story of that sort or history, whatever it is. Um, please feel free to come to that and share. It's usually pretty interesting because we never know quite what the program's going to be. In February, which is Black History Month, we have Samantha Dorn, who will be giving a presentation on migrations of African American families, uh, voluntary and involuntary. She's traced many of her family lines before they came to York County um, through slavery and when they were sold different places and families got split up and, and ended up different places. And some of them then ended up here in York. Um, in March, we have a um, Lisa Wolfson who will be speaking about the Welcome Society, William Penn settling 
Pennsylvania and some of those first Quakers that came with William Penn around 1683. Um, right now, April, I do not have a meeting. It looks like the May meeting will be at the Sacred Heart Basilica in Irish Town, Adams County, near McSherry's Towns, known as Conewaga Chapel. They have recently gone through a extensive renovations of that um, and it will all be finished. They found frescoes on the walls, which were just sort of painted white. They've done a painstaking um, restoration of removing a century or so of paint and found frescoes that were put on. They also rediscovered in a corn building on their property, the original Italian marble altar, which is being restored. So the appearance of the interior of the church very much look like a church from Europe when you went in before, and I think it's going to look a little bit more like uh, a Catholic church from Europe, which if you've never been to Europe, they kind of take your breath away. So it's uh, a very interesting uh, place to visit if you've never been there. So that should be well worthwhile. Our June meeting uh, is a Henry James Young Award. Um, nominations for that for excellence in genealogy and local history are still available to be made. If there's someone that you would like to nominate, please let us know. We'll make a decision on that probably early in the new year uh, once the nominations are closed out. Check out our newsletter uh, for that. So we're very pleased today to have as our speaker, Scott Mingus. He's spoken to us before and is always highly entertaining and very knowledgeable. Probably without a doubt, he is the foremost expert on the Civil War in York County. Um, he's a multiple award-winning author and is a retired scientist and executive in the global specialty paper industry. Uh, Scott is a native of the state of Ohio and graduated from Miami University. He was a part of the research team that developed the first commercially successful self-adhesive U.S. postage stamp. I'm old enough to remember licking postage <laughs> stamps, so that was a great development. And he was a pioneer in the early development of barcode labels. He has written more than 30 Civil War and Underground Railroad books and numerous articles for Gettysburg Magazine and other historical journals. He has appeared on C-SPAN, C-SPAN 3, PBS, PCN, and several other TV networks. Scott writes a blog on the Civil War history of York County where he and his wife, Debbie, live. He also has written six scenario books for miniature wargaming. He received lifetime achievement awards from the York County History Center and the Camp Curtin Historical Society for his many contributions to local Civil War history. The Gettysburg Civil Roundtable recently presented Scott and co-author Eric Wittenberg with the 2023 Batchelder Coddington Award for the best new book on the Gettysburg campaign, if we are striking for Pennsylvania. If you'll please join me in welcoming Scott Mingus. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Sounds good. Come with me 160 years ago, back to York County. Like many of the visitors to York County 160 years ago, most of these folks weren't from here. I came here myself as a stranger in July of 2001 from Cleveland, Ohio, fell in love with York County and fell in love with York County's history, particularly the Civil War history and Underground Railroad history of York County. Did you know one out of every seven Confederate soldiers that fought at Gettysburg got there via York County. Did you know one out of every nine Union soldiers to fight at Gettysburg came through York County first? We were an important part of the Gettysburg campaign. It's a part that's been largely forgotten in a lot of areas today, but it was pretty important back in 1863 what was going on here in this particular area. So let's step back. 160 years ago, maybe. Well, it, it was working. <laughs> Let's try this again. You, you trying to down the down arrow? Yeah, I'm trying to. Okay. We might have fallen asleep. It seems like it might. Have. All right, if not.
Okay. Yeah, the fingers crossed. Yeah. There we go. There we go. All right. Stupid drunk. Yeah. All right. There we go. 160 years ago, the Confederate Army was in desperate shape. The Civil War had been going on for 18 months. There was no immediate prospects for Confederate victory. Confederate War Department, most notably Secretary of War James Seddon, and the President of the Confederate States of America, Jefferson Davis, met with key members of the Confederate High Command, as well as General Robert E. Lay. They have decided that the only way, realistically, to win the war is to invade the North. Now, it's not a new idea. Back in 1862, Stonewall Jackson had told a Confederate congressman, give me 36,000 men and I will take the war to the banks of the Susquehanna. Where? Harrisburg, of course. And the Antietam campaign in September of 1862 was directly aimed at heading to Pennsylvania. Obviously, they didn't get there. Just a month later, Jeff Stewart brings more than a thousand Confederate cavalrymen into Franklin County, Pennsylvania, the first significant invasion of Pennsylvania. They got as far as Chambersburg, marched into Adams County, came within six miles of Gettysburg before returning to Maryland and on to Virginia. All that was a precursor to 1863. Stonewall Jackson's death, but Robert E. Lee, by the spring of 1863, wants to repeat the attempt on Pennsylvania. The reasons are almost identical in 1863 as they were in 1862. Get the war out of Virginia. Farmers have been feeding now by now, spring of 1863, 18 months of warfare. Food supplies are so bad in Robert E. Lee's army. He's bringing cattle up from Virginia by rail, uh, from Florida into Virginia by rail. That's not sustainable. They need the supplies of the North. More importantly, they need a victory on northern soil. In 1862, the plan was beat the Yankees in South Central Pennsylvania and influence the 1862 congressional elections. Well, 1863, there is no congressional elections, but you got state elections, including the governor of Pennsylvania, who's up for re-election in 1863, and has been at that point heavily challenged by Peace Democrat Judge George Woodward. So there's a thought that maybe they can still flip the politics, but more, even more importantly is, can we bring Labor and Lincoln to the negotiating table? Can we force the United States Army to lose a key battle in the North and then draw war, uh, peace prize from all the folks who do not want the war anymore? They got some secondary goals. Believe it or not, Robert E. Lee will achieve most of the goals secondary goals. They'll achieve none of the major goals. But as far as getting the war out of Virginia, check that. Taking pressure off the farmers, absolutely. Divert attention from Vicksburg. Yeah, they do that. Uh, Ambrose Burnside and the entire Union Ninth Corps are moved uh, from on their way to Mississippi to reinforce U.S. Grant. They're moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. And then on, they're going to be in my hometown, Zanesville, Ohio, as the Battle of Gettysburg begins on their way to Pittsburgh. Uh, and of course, threatening the railroads, and we're going to talk about that. Now, we're going to focus a lot of our attention today on two guys who are Confederate generals. The first of which is Jubal Anderson Early. Early is a longtime Whig uh, politically from uh, the Lynchburg, Virginia area. He's actually born and raised in uh, north, northwestern Virginia. He had 6,600 men. Some of the very best troops in the Confederate Army are under this guy's command. He's going to be one of the key people we're going to chat about. Robert E. Lee commands the Army of Northern Virginia and split up into what's called three corps or three major subunits the First Corps, Second Corps, and Third Corps. Second Corps is commanded by Richard Yule. This is part of the unit that Stonewall Jackson had commanded until he dies in May of 1863. Underneath Jubal Early is mentioned 6,600 men from Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, and from Virginia. On June 3rd, Robert E. Lee sets the invasion in motion, starts moving his men uh, northwest from their base camp at Hamilton's Crossing in at Fredericksburg, Virginia, near the Rappahannock River. They're going to move northwest to Culpeper. Uh, as they're moving, they are going to disguise their movements of the Union Army commander. Guy named Joseph Hooker cannot tell that the Confederates are on the march. They are going to have 
giant bonfires at night. At daylight, they're marching in left and right to create massive amounts of dust clouds. So Union balloonists can't figure out what's going on on Confederate lines. It goes on for days. By the time they get done, two thirds of Lee's army is on the road and the entire United States Army of the Potomac is still sitting in their trenches on the other side of the Rappahannock River. On June 9th, there's gonna be a battle fought at Brady Station near Culpeper. That's really the first time the United States Army has an idea that maybe Lee is not planning on renewing hostilities near the Rappahannock River, maybe he's going somewhere else. And nobody's really sure where he's going. Now, the Army of the Potomac is still sitting at Fredericksburg. There's no way in the world if the Confederates are moving north to Pennsylvania, which some people in Washington believe, there's no way in the world the Union Army can get to Pennsylvania before Robert E. Lee can. Can't win that race. So their second thought is we need to really make sure Lee's not turning around and is going to attack Baltimore or Washington from the north. That's what he does in 1864 with Jim Worley, who's going to loop into Maryland, come down into Washington from the north and try to attack. Of course, that attack in July of 1864 is stopped at Fort Stevens. That's what they fear in 1863 that Lee wants to do. And so they got to guard all the roads. Well, here in Pennsylvania, the governor, Republican Andrew Gregg Curtin from Belfast, is absolutely convinced that they're coming to Harrisburg. His spies and his intelligence network back in 1862 had told him they were coming to Harrisburg. He certainly believes the same is true now. He's got a telegraph office right in his capital, right in his office. And he's got an antic room where he actually has a telegraph line coming directly into the governor's office. It's the only governor that I can find in the entire Civil War that has his own private telegraph line running into his office. And it keeps him abreast of what's happening throughout the, the idea. He keeps hammering on Washington. They're coming to Pennsylvania. In fact, he sends the assistant, former assistant secretary of war, Colonel Thomas Scott, who was his personal advisor, the former, like I said, uh, assistant secretary of war and vice president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. He sends him to Washington to plead with Lincoln personally. The rebels are coming to Pennsylvania. You got to be able to stop them. How's the US government respond? They send one general and no men to defend Pennsylvania. The general comes and arrives, finds that there's 57 United States regular soldiers in all of this part of the Commonwealth to defend the state. And there are 70,000 Confederates potentially on the road to Pennsylvania and 57 US regulars to stop them. There's no other troops other than home guard units, Every little town, including York, has a little militia set up. Back here in downtown York, up and down the street and back of us are men drilling with broomsticks. <laughs> up and down the street for hours with brooms. They don't have guns, but they're drilling at least, trying to find out what's going on, uh, and at least trying to prepare to defend York if they have to. The major general, his name's Dryas Couch, he's actually a distant relative of my wife, believe it or not. General Couch shows up. Uh, and comes to Harrisburg and realizes the governor's dead serious. We got a problem with the potential invasion. On June 12th, it becomes painfully clear to Pennsylvania that we're in the crosshairs. Why? Because the better army now abandons all thought and pretense that they're going to Baltimore or Washington. They cross into the Shenandoah Valley. And if you know where the Shenandoah, anybody know where the Shenandoah Valley dumps? Where does it end? Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. We call it the Cumberland Valley here in Pennsylvania, but it is the Shenandoah Valley, it's the same geological formation. It stops at Dillsburg, at Her uh, just on the gates of Harrisburg. So any Confederate army in the Shenandoah Valley is clearly coming to Pennsylvania. And so everybody's now well aware of this is what the problem is. And on the next day, it becomes very, very clear at the second battle of Winchester, the second largest battle of the Gettysburg campaign, 87th Pennsylvania from York and Adams County, it's mostly from York County, is part of the defenses uh, at Second Winchester, three day battle. They are going to surrender. They're going to lose more than 65 to 70% of their men, uh, mostly prisoners of war. They're going to actually, believe it or not, walk from Winchester, Virginia to York, Pennsylvania. They're going to walk here to try to get home. Uh, 
and the army's almost this division is almost all but destroyed. It'll never fight again. It's a division. General Milroy uh, commanded on this disgrace. It takes him a year to get a job back. He never gets his original job back. What this does, though, is it opens the doors to Pennsylvania. These 8,000 guys that are Winchester's job was to stop any Confederate raiders from heading to Pennsylvania, i.e. Jeff Stewart with 1,000 cavalrymen in 1862. This job is to repeat, is to stop a repeat of that on uh, 1863. What they never anticipate is the entire Confederate army coming to Pennsylvania. They just assume it's going to be Jeff Stewart and a bunch of guys on a horse. No, 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 all 70,000 Confederates in the Army of Northern Virginia are now on the road to Pennsylvania. Very clear. And Lincoln, of course, now has to do something about that. Some people in Washington are still not convinced that the target is Pennsylvania. The president asked for 100,000 volunteers. Why? Because the U.S. Army is not getting here. So we don't have a standing National Guard in any of these states along the border. So we need to raise troops. We need to raise them now. He calls for 100,000 volunteers, 25,000 from Ohio, including my great-great-grandfather, who comes and joins one of the Ohio uh, National Guard units that are suddenly being raised. Um, he raises 25,000 in West Virginia, including another ancestor of mine, joins the emergency militia in West Virginia. And he calls for 50,000 in Pennsylvania, which the governor, back to the summer, there's Governor Curtin. He wants 50,000 men. He issues that broadside, which actually is posted here in York. The enemy is approaching. Not that they may be going to Columbus, Ohio. They may be going to Wheeling. They may be going to Baltimore. No, no, no. He says the enemy is approaching. His approaching Harrisburg. They're coming to Pennsylvania. He needs men to sign up. He wants 50,000. That's the quota that Lincoln has set. He's only going to get 7,000 volunteers, only 75 of which are from York County. So he calls for 50,000 men. We got 75 volunteers from this area that, uh, and almost all of them are from southwestern New York County. Now, this is the river defenses back in 1863. You can see some familiar things here. Of course, there's the turnpike, US Route 30, slash 462. Uh, there's the bridge of Wrightsville. There's the Susquehanna River, of course. This is the railroad. Uh, in the Hanover Junction, up from Baltimore, ran up North Elmira, New York. Uh, Northern Central Railway at Hanover Junction had a spur that ran through Jefferson to Hanover, New Oxford, over to Gettysburg. And of course, you had the Pennsylvania Railroad running down to Columbia, Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad running to Philly, and the Cumberland Valley Railroad running down to Hagerstown, Maryland. Robert E. Lee needs to break apart all those railroads. He's going to succeed uh, in doing that to almost all of this. The U.S. government, though, with far less troops than they think they're going to have. We want 50,000 guys, I got 7,000. So he's going to put 1,000 of those guys in York County, 800 of them between Wrightsville and York Haven, and the remaining guys are going to be sent to Hanover Junction. He's going to send a regiment of 743 guys over to Gettysburg, he's going to put another full regiment of about 900 guys in Lakes, or uh, in Columbia, and then the rest of the guys are going to be in Harrisburg. The Republican governor of Pennsylvania has to do something he doesn't want to do. He swallows his pride, sends telegrams to the Democratic governors of New Jersey and New York, who have existing state militia, National Guard units that are always been there, uh, they're permanent. And he says, please send your troops to rescue Pennsylvania. And they do. In a credible display of bipartisanship, 1863 style, Within hours, train loads of troops are leaving both New Jersey and New York bound for Harrisburg. Uh, so the Democrats and Republicans come to a budget agreement and off they go. <laughs> it's a lot easier back then, I guess. All right, so here's the world's longest covered bridge at Wrightsville. Uh, technically the second longest covered bridge ever built on earth. The original one just upstream 500 yards or so. Uh, had been knocked down by ice in the 1830s, rebuilt downstream, slightly shorter bridge. Uh, so technically, this is the second longest bridge ever built uh, uh, out of wood, covered bridge on earth. But the important thing about this bridge is it's the only bridge from Harrisburg south to Conowingo, Maryland. You want to cross the Susquehanna River in 1863, there is a ford in York Cabin. That's why they need to guard York Cabin. 
And there's a bunch of ferry boats, McCall's Ferry, et cetera, but nobody's operating the ferries and all those ferry boats are sent to the east side of the river. So the only way to cross the Susquehanna River in 1863 in York County is the bridge at Wrightsville. And the only way to cross it at Harrisburg is the two bridges side by side, the Camelback Covered Bridge and the Cumberland Valley Railroad's Iron Bridge and then cross over the river. But well, this bridge becomes really important in both the Union plans and the Confederate plans. So we go back here, get pointing out from Harrisburg South, that's it. So if you want to protect Harrisburg, you're the Union commander. By all means, protect that bridge crossing there. Slow them down here. Slow them down there as best you can. You're not going to you're not going to save this stuff. You can at least slow them down. But nobody's crossing the river. That is why General Couch is sitting in Harrisburg. He has orders. No armed Confederate may cross the Susquehanna River. That's a real simple order. That's why he panics almost when he arrives with 57 guys. And an army of 70,000 coming, and I got to keep them off the river. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what you got to do, General Couch. All right, so these emergency militia, 7,000 guys are being hastily trained, as mentioned. They're going to send one regiment to York County, they're going to send another regiment to Columbia, and send a third regiment to Gettysburg. The other 4,000 guys stay at Harrisburg, and they guard those bridges along with 10,000 New Yorkers and about 1,000 boys from New Jersey who all show up. All right, June 15th through the 19th, here comes the infantry and artillery, uh, or sorry, the cavalry, and the artillery starting into Pennsylvania. This is a supply rate. Remember I say that Robert E. Lee has many goals for the invasion, one of which is supplies. Lee's men will come into the western side of Franklin County, they'll cross Cove Mountain into a uh, big Cove area. They will raid the Connellsburg. They will take cattle, food, supplies back. By the time the Gettysburg campaign's over, the Confederate Army has brought 67,000 head of cows out of Pennsylvania. There will be York County cattle eaten by the Confederate Army as late as the spring of 1865. So Robert E. Lee can prolong the Civil War for almost two years based on the food supplies he gathers in Pennsylvania. We always think Gettysburg's a massive failure for Lee, and it is militarily wise and strategically, but it prolongs the war because his coming to Pennsylvania and Maryland enables him to feed his army. And that's what this first raid is. The 15th to the 19th, that's a supply raid, and a very successful one at that. 19th to 22nd, back you come to raid the eastern part of Franklin County. Again, taking stuff out. By that point in time, the state militia is on its way. The train comes through York County, uh, has crossed the bridge of Red Columbia, went through Wrightsville, steamed to York, turned at York, head south, went to Hanover Junction, turned west at Hanover Junction, went through New Oxford and Hanover, and now it was arrived at Gettysburg. They're going to send 100 of the best soldiers out to stop the Confederates. They can't find 100 guys that have ever fired a gun before. That's a problem. Uh, but they're at least going to give it a shot. Uh, so they're out there trying to, and on Sunday night, June 25th, they're, June 21st, the first small battle in Pennsylvania soil occurred. And what that does is panic everybody. If you're a Marylander, in the path of Robert E. Lee's oncoming army. If you're from Franklin or Fulton or Cumberland counties, you now know the rebels are on their way. We don't know how many refugees come through York. All we know is there's traffic jams that stretch from Wrightsville to the west side of York. We think we have traffic problems now on 30. Before 62, we've never had stacked up all the way to the river, at least I know of, unless short of an accident. But back then, it's stacked up right in front of us here, Market Street, you know, at the time the turnpike. You know, you've got the, what they do record, believe it or not, in Harrisburg at the toll bridge at Harrisburg, they record whether you're white or black for some weird reason. I don't know why, but they did. 1,800 uh, black people and over 4,000 white people cross that bridge, almost all of them refugees. Oh, by the way, it's not free. And so you are paying across that bridge. Here's the bridge of Wrightsville. This is the only known photograph taken. This is Columbia. This is Wrightsville. Here's the canal. There's the bridge. This little structure here is a towpath for the canal. Uh, they actually dammed up the river out here, and they'll uh, use 14 uh, mule teams to 
uh, walk them up here with a long tow rope and they'll drag the canal boats across. We have college boys from over in Lancaster County at Franklin Marshall and Millersville, where my oldest son actually did his master's thesis on the burning the rights of bridge. It's got like Danny Hook for this stuff. Uh, Millersville uh, college students come back across the bridge, the right still when they're constructing. But here's what the tolls were about a buck for a freight wagon and a horse, 30 cents for a carriage, uh, a horse team, 16 and a half cents for a horse and rider, or six cents for a pedestrian. Oh, by the way, they define pedestrian as anything that crosses the bridge. You got a herd of cows, each one's a pedestrian. You got 10 horses you're escorting. Uh, okay, well, okay. You got your kids riding the horses too to help protect them. Well, that's 16 and a half cents for every one of them. And keep in mind, this is not the first time your counties have started moving across the river. It's not the first time refugees from Franklin County and Adams County have come in here. Happened in 62. In September, happened again in October when Jeff Stewart went through. For a lot of these guys, this is the third time they've had to cross the bridge with their entire flocks of sheep, with their entire herds of horses, with their entire earthly possessions in many cases. It's getting expensive at that point in time. And a lot of people are getting tired of this because the rebels never come. They never come. The college boys do a great job of digging entrenchments. They're joined by railroad workers, townspeople from Wrightsville. This is 462. That's the world's largest covered bridge. This is Craig's Creek. That's the railroad tracks uh, coming in on the Northern Central Railway. Just get an idea of what it might have looked like. On June 22nd through the 25th, here's the problem. Here comes the infantry. It's no longer a cavalry raid for horses. This is now a direct raid on Harrisburg with the most powerful Confederate army in the country. Robert E. Lee. Eight victories, no losses, and maybe a tie at Antietam, to his credit. He's never lost a battle, folks. You got an undefeated army coming into your territory, and the only thing you got to stop them is a state militia with three days of training, most of them have never fired a gun in their life. Do you have any clue how terrifying that would have been to the people of Pennsylvania? We got these folks running a mile. They're coming everywhere. And then Richard Yule, Robert E. Lee's uh, commander of the second corps, gets these orders. If Harrisburg comes within your name, this is Harrisburg. There's those two twin bridges, Railroad Bridge, Camelback Bridge. This, of course, is uh, uh, Cumberland County. This is Harrisburg. If Harrisburg comes within your means, capture it. So now we know. If Harrisburg comes within your means, go get it. But the goal's not Harrisburg. The goal is to draw the Union Army into Pennsylvania and beat it. That's what Robert E. Lee's number one job is. If you can get Harrisburg where you're doing this, terrific. But the goal is to wipe the Union Army out in Pennsylvania. So he gives orders to Jim Worley. That's the guy. Go to York, destroy the Northern Central Railway, remember supplies and you know, Union's uh, uh, communications routes, destroy the bridge, and march to Dillsburg. How many of you are aware that Robert E. Lee intended to fight the Battle of Gettysburg at Dillsburg? You guys know that? Read the Confederate orders very carefully, and you'll see that Dillsburg was a concentration point for the widely scattered Army of Northern Virginia until the Yankee Army moved into Pennsylvania a lot faster than Robert E. Lee ever thought they would do. And so he changed it to Heidlersburg and Cashtown and Gettysburg. Before that, we would be uh, here in York County touring the Dillsburg National Military Park. <laughs> and we have a little more York County history to talk about here, Jonathan, Richard, Adam. <laughs> We've been celebrating or maybe mourning, depending who won, the Battle of Dillsburg. That's what Lee is supposed to do. That's the goal, come here. So Friday, June 26th, once we three inches of rain to fall, a horrible day, absolutely miserable weather. We can relate to that, right? You know, we've had a ton of rain this year. Well, back in 1863, they had a miserable year as well. And they had a drought as well in the late fall, much like it was this year. Confederates have sprung out on two roads, Route 11 and Route 30, and they're heading towards those two sets of bridges. Two thirds of the Confederate Army going for the two bridges in Harrisburg, one third of the Confederate forces in Pennsylvania, heading east through Gettysburg, New York, uh, heading towards Wrightsville, the bridge that is here. 
on uh, the afternoon of June 22nd, uh, 26th, the Confederates take Gettysburg. How many of you knew the Confederate Army had Gettysburg, Pennsylvania a week before the battle? They're running, they have a town. They chase off the state militia. They will sleep where the giant food mart is today on Route 30 uh, on, the, on the west side of Gettysburg. That is the Confederate campsite after taking Gettysburg. They take the town. They have the high ground, you know, the beloved high ground everybody talks about, Cemetery Hill. Confederate Calvary are on Cemetery Hill, June 26th. They've got it. They got Cemetery Ridge. They could have Culp's Hill if they wanted it. They have the town of Gettysburg. They've got everything. Town surrenders. Joe Worley meets with city council, ransoms Gettysburg for supplies. They lower the U.S. flag. This is 462. Most of these buildings are still there. That's the building where Abraham Lincoln will sleep the night before he does the Gettysburg Address. That's Will's house. Uh, this is by our fellow Yorker, Bradley Schmel, uh, lives over off Eastern Boulevard. Saturday, June 27th, we don't want Gettysburg. <laughs> we want the bridges. And so the Confederates abandon Gettysburg, start marching into this area, and now it's going to get really nasty for York County. As the Confederates start moving into this area, farmers in York County start responding by making strange hand gestures. They're waving yellow pieces of paper, and they're crying mostly in broken English because most of them are German farmers. They're crying, peace, peace. Why are they doing that? Because con men from New York City have come to York County in the days before the Confederates do. And they tell the farmers of York County for only $1. We know you didn't vote for Lincoln. Manheim Township, for example, West Manheim Township, 174 votes for the slave-owning Kentucky Vice President of the United States, John Breckinridge, two votes for Abraham Lincoln. York County does not like Abraham Lincoln with a passion particularly Southern York County. 22 votes in Fedora's Township versus 400 for the opponents. It's just miserable the way they think about Republicans in the Southern part of the county. And that's where the con men hit. They go to all these German farmers and they say, we know you didn't vote for Lincoln. We know you don't support the war. And we know you're a friend of the South. So when the Confederates arrive, show them the secret password of peace, peace. Show them the secret hand signals. Show them the yellow piece of paper, your membership card, the Knights of the Golden Circle, and they'll know you didn't vote for Lincoln. Throughout your county, people buy the tickets. Throughout Cumberland County, Adams County, these con men go everywhere. They're con men from New York City. They're not good for the Confederates. They just know the politics of South Central Pennsylvania. They will openly brag in the New York newspapers uh, in late July, that we sold thousands of tickets in Pennsylvania, most notably in Cadoras and North Cadoras Township. Richard, which county is that in? North County. They openly brag in the New York newspapers that they sell more tickets in North County than anywhere. Of course they do. So when the Confederates do arrive at those farms, they're waving the tickets, they're making the hand gestures. And the Confederates knock them out of their hands and they go out in the fields and they take all the cows and horses. Why? Because those guys are trusting in those tickets. They believe the con men when they said the Confederates won't bother you because you didn't vote for Lincoln. It's all a farce. Confederates don't know anything about that. As Joe Worley later writes, these things were all new to us. The purchases of these mysteries have been badly sold. That house right there, some of you recognize, that's on East Berlin Road at the intersection with South Salem Church Road, right back there. That's the Charles Sanger farm. Uh, he buys a ticket, and he loses four horses. Uh, kind of an expensive ticket, folks, by the way. And I love this quote by Joe Trundle. There's another farm along East Berlin Road. We gave the old Dutch and Pennsylvania fits, our army left the mark everywhere. A win, horses, cattle, sheep, hogs, chickens, spring houses, supper to life. They cried, peace, peace, most beautifully, wherever we went. Peace, peace, again, is the password of the Knights of the Golden Circle. That's this supposed Confederate sympathy group that did not exist at the continent for New York City. It didn't exist in Pennsylvania, at least this part of Pennsylvania. Elijah White, Confederate Calvary, going to read Anna Rejection. This is Anna Rejection in November of 1863. With everything going to pot, York's leaders decide we got a problem. Now, a young York businessman triggers everything by riding out on his own, goes out west to Adamstown, finds the Confederate Army, 
and decides to negotiate with him on his own to save his factory and to save the town of York's women and children. So he tells him. Same stunt is pulled in 1862 when he rides down to Virginia and finds his college roommate, Robert E. Lee's son, which triggers, again, a repeat in 1863. This is new, folks. None of this stuff's new. And so he rides out, negotiates with the Confederates, rides back into town, tells the chief burgess of the town, David Small, here's what I did. I surrendered York. And Chief Burgess is like, on whose authority should you do that? You can't do that. Only city council and I can. So the Chief Burgess grabs a U.S. military officer, George Hay, um, and uh, gets a couple other guys. And they start heading guys from city council, bipartisan, and they head back out. They go to farmers, and in that house, York will formally surrender at that house. But all the Confederates are still on the march. They're heading there anyway. Now, Jim Worley starts planning in his own mind. Remember his orders. Seize, uh, burn the bridge, and march to Dillsburg. Well, the state militia has been so horrible so far, not defending Gettysburg, not defending York, not defending Hanover, that he decides, you know, maybe I could be the next Jeff Davis. Maybe I can end the Civil War. Joe Worley decides on his own, I'm going to grab the bridge of Wrightsville. I'm going to seize a thousand horses in Lancaster County. I'm going to mount the Louisiana Tigers on them. And I'm going to take Harrisburg myself. Against orders, his orders to go to Dillsburg. But this guy's never been real big on uh, orders. Robert E. Lee eventually fires him a year later in 1860, well, actually early 65, uh, basically for insubordination, among many other things. But that's his goal. His goal. He's going to do all this. So now it's Sunday, June 28th, they come into York County, courtesy of the York County History Center, Adam. Here is uh, a Louis Miller print. This is uh, again 462 Market Street. That's Gettysburg's way out there. Here they are coming into downtown York. Here's General Jim Early, the second command, John Gordon. There's the town council uh, of York sitting there waiting. They're coming in with the pioneers, the guys with their job to break down any barricades that workers may have put up in the roads. One little old lady, I don't know who she may be, let's say, let's pick her just for the sake of it. She sees them and she screams and faints, my God, they're coming to bury us. Because workers have no clue what's going to happen. They're going to burn our town. They're going to burn our people. Are they going to kill us? What's going to happen here in your county? Uh, and they see these guys with pickaxes and shovels leading the way. What else are they supposed to think to come into town? Another Lloyd Miller print courtesy of York County History Center showing the Confederates loving their uh, U.S. flag on this massive 85 foot flagpole. Again, this is uh, Center Square right here. That's East Market, uh, West Market Street right there. History Center beyond, somewhere down beyond those trees. Here we are. 6 p.m., uh, General Gordon, the second command of Early's men, is going to attack Wrightsville. Here's these entrenchments that those college boys and railroad men had built in and around Wrightsville. They're going to order that bridge destroyed. And interesting, the Confederates wanted to burn the bridge. Now they want to save the bridge. The Yankees wanted to save the bridge. Now they got to burn it. So you can see both sides have just turned around in their objectives and what they're trying to do. So now the state militia, oh, very smartly, you often read that the state militia burns the Wrightsville Bridge. No, they don't. They order four civilians who are stockholders in the bridge to burn it. That way the army didn't burn the bridge. And to this day, the Lancaster County's politicians, not only their Congress people, are still trying to get money back from the US government for the destruction of the bridge. Every single congressman from Lancaster County since the Civil War has gotten up on the floor of Congress at one point in their in their, their term in office and asked the government for money. It's all ceremony, they're never gonna get a dime, but again, that shows how smart the government was. We don't have to pay the bill. Uh, you guys burned your own bridge. Uh, so, and there it is. This is the Wrightsville, uh, this is uh, Wrightsville side, that's Wrightsville right there. There's Helen Hills. Here is the uh, Columbia side. There's the uh, canal right here. All the water's been taken out of the canal. Uh, you got canal boats now sitting in the river. You see guys in the canal trying to build the fences. Here it comes. And oh, by the way, down here are 57 free black men, not in uniform, 
but they're giving guns by the U.S. Army. These guys here are the patients for the U.S. Army hospital here in York, wearing their characteristic light blue uniforms of an invalid. Uh, and here come the state militia, three days of training, marching out uh, from the bridge. When shifts, bridge captains on fire, Confederates form a bucket brigade. This is the Wrightsville site again. This is Wrightsville Front Street. Uh, that's the old canal, uh, now a park. Uh, they're going to form a bucket brigade and they're going to save the town of Wrightsville from burning down. Monday, June 29th, the local kids, U.S. Army is now alive in Pennsylvania. But the Confederates were still heading to Dillsburg. Here's Major James Nowman. He's come into York County. He's, his job is to scare Dillsburg and get it ready for the Confederate occupation and concentration. Why? You get guys here with Chambersburg, you guys in Carlisle, you guys here. Where's a good place for the low to meet? Dillsburg. That's where Lee wants to go. But the Union Army has changed his plans. But now they're in Pennsylvania four or five days before he thought they were ever going to get here. This is Mary Jane Real Walt. She's my hero. As the Confederates labor to save the town uh, by that bucket brigade, she tells the Confederate General John Gordon that uh, somebody in the morning, uh, you know, bridge now burned down. Somebody in the morning, I'll feed you. He thinks she's a spy because when he's here in York, he's been given a uh, bouquet of red roses with a complete plan of the fences of Wrightsville on them. He thinks, good, this is great. And it's written in a quote unquote, a woman's flowery handwriting. I found my spot. York County doesn't like Lincoln. I found my spot. She's not a spy. She is a Lincoln supporter. She mouths off to a Confederate general that she's just invited to breakfast. I just tell you that with my assent and approval, my husband's a soldier in the Union Army, and Mike wants to pray to heavens at our cause because Lincoln. May triumph the union be saved. Have you ever mouth off to an enemy general in your kitchen? How gutsy. John Gordon could have had a shot on the spot. Instead, he later writes, and I quote, other than my sated mother and my beloved wife, the heroine of the Susquehanna is the bravest woman in America, a York County woman, Mary Jane Rewalt, the bravest woman in America. That's the bridge after it's been burned down. Joe Early is going to ransom York. This is a receipt. He wants a hundred thousand. Oh, he wants a hundred thousand bucks. He's not going to get it. There we go. He's going to get twenty eight thousand six hundred and ten dollars from the actual receipt left with York on that day. Uh, twenty years later, he'll ask York for the rest of the money, or he'll turn your fair city into a collection agency. Never does that. Tuesday, June 30th, rebels are now starting to leave York County. Battle's starting to, uh, everybody's starting to assemble at Gettysburg. Here's John Buford bringing the Army of Potomac's cavalry into play. And here's Jeb Stewart heading to Dillsburg. Why? He doesn't know they're supposed to go here. He's still on the original plan go to York, find you Gorley, go to Dover, and go to Dillsburg. He never gets the update. And so here he goes. But before Joe Worley leaves on the morning of June 30, he writes this nasty gram to the city of York, basically saying, you know, I could have burned your town down. I should have burned your down, town down. What you guys did to me down south, to my people in the south, it's almost criminal. I could have rolled by the torch. But, you know, we're gentlemen. We don't do that. We don't do the things you Yankees do. It's kind of a sarcastic letter. Read it sometimes. I think the York County History Center has a copy of it somewhere here, Adam, I think, in your collection. All right, almost done. Jeff Stewart arrives in Hanover the same day, almost dies, jumps over his horse over a ditch, managed to save himself. At that point, a year later, he won't save himself. He'll die in Yellow Tavern in Virginia. But he should have died in Hanover, or at least been captured. But in Hanover, he managed to escape, get on his way to Dillsburg. He thinks that he's going to drive this captured Union wagon train throughout York County, present it to Robert E. Lee as a gesture of good faith. So to save him, that wagon train becomes paramount in his mind. He's going to ride to Jefferson and try to save the train by riding through Jefferson. What he does in the way, though, he grabs three or three southwestern York counties off of West Manor and Township uh, and kidnaps them as guides, forces them to lead his troops to Dillsburg. Uh, and then when he gets to Dillsburg, he lets them go and steals their horses, makes them walk from Dillsburg to Hanover. Not a pleasant walk, I'm sure. 
Defendants are going to have a rest break in Jefferson. They're going to raid all the stores. Every single store, they're grabbing all the stuff. Why do they want so much cavern and want so much uh, uh, thought? Because it reinforces the britches of their pants, makes them softer to ride in the uh, saddles, less hemorrhoids, etc. So clock becomes a military target throughout York County, as well as York County cigars. Love that. <laughs> Even then, the cigar industry was already burgeoning during the county. It takes six hours for the Confederates to go through York, New Salem, just a 17-mile-long column at the peak. We're going to pause at this farm. This is right in back of uh, Rudders, uh, the intersection of South Salem Church Road and Route 30. Confederates talk about, I love this quote, variable drowsy land in York County where we move through a horseback. The Dutchman, the crowds spreading as apple butter. The sauerkraut, the conestogas, that's the uh, horses, the red red barns, the guttural voices, the strange faces. Moving here from Cleveland, I echo a lot of that. <laughs> there are a lot of big barns in York County, and they're almost all red, at least they always used to be at one point in time. And by the way, you guys do cook well, really well. Stuart's going to ride to Dover. This, believe it or not, is the Tom Station in Dover at the intersection of Canal uh, Road and uh, Carlisle Main Street. July 1st, Battle of Gettysburg begins. Oh, here's Jeff going to Dillsburg. Of course, that's where he's supposed to go. Uh, he's not out lost. He's just going where he's supposed to go. Uh, they're going to finally leave Dover and way to Dillsburg. They're going to cross over this bridge and no longer exists. This photograph was taken in the 1960s or so. And I love this final quote. You said to see the Dutch people in York County turning out water and milk and bread and butter and apple butter for the ragged reds. I was quite surprised at the tone of feeling in that part of the state. Two or three instances, I found people who seemed really glad to see us, and the scores of houses they had refreshments at the door for the soldiers. People bought because people really didn't know what to think. I don't think they would have been all astonished if every building had been set on fire by us as we reached it, nor would a great many have been surprised if we had concluded the business by massacring the women and children. I'll submit to you something we don't talk about very often. And that's the mindset of the people of York County. Yeah, we may have surrendered to the Confederates. So that, that's debatable what term you want to use. But the one thing that's not debatable is the terror. People are scared to death. We have no clue what this enemy army is going to do. I bet rumors are going to burn a town. Do they ever burn a town? Yes. A year later, they burn Chambersburg to the ground. Half the buildings to Chambersburg are destroyed in July 1864. These people in York County are terrorized. These tickets aren't working, folks. We by now know the tickets don't work. Everybody's telling us, fleeing into York, fleeing into Dillsburg, come in. Tickets aren't working, we don't know what else to do. Rebels come to our farm, let's put milk and cookies out for them. Maybe they won't burn our farms to the ground. And I love this book. By the way, his dad's a United States Senator. Louis Wigfall, later governor of Texas. And this is his kid, 18. Imagine, Tristan, you're 18. We'll be so shortly. 18 year old kid writes this fascinating letter about York County is being terrorized, frightened to death. And that's the thing we need to remember. We look at this through 21st century eyes. We need to look at this through the eyes of the people who are here. These people were scared to death. They had no clue what was going to happen to them. Stuart arrives in Dillsburg, and of course, the Dillsburg learns there's no rebels here. There's nobody here. And for the first time, here's maybe I need to go to Carlisle. There were Confederates in Carlisle, but what there? He still doesn't know he's supposed to be where? Gettysburg. There's no clue. This is July 1st, folks. They've been fighting all day on July 1st. What's he doing on July 1st? Riding through Warrington and Washington townships on their way to Carroll Township. And so they head to Dillsburg, nobody there, I'm gonna to go to Carlisle. Meanwhile, battle at Gettysburg's raging. Again, one out of every seven Confederates, all of Jubal early, 6,600 guys, all of uh, Jeff Stewart's 4,500 guys, plus another 300 under James Mountain. They're in York County, one out of every seven are in York County before the battle occurs. July 2nd, of course, final day the Confederates are in York County. They're marching from Dillsburg down through Clear Spring, following today's Route 11, uh, Route 15. At York Springs, it goes early uh, 
Stewart's men all reunite at York Springs. And they're going to head down, fight about a hundred sound. And finally, at four o'clock on July 2nd, Jeff Stewart, after making this loop, finally arrives at Gettysburg a day and a half after the battle's already begun. Why? Because he goes to Dillsburg and he fights a battle in Hanover he's not expecting to. And then he makes a mistake of going to Carlisle and finally learns at Carlisle I need to be at Gettysburg. Final impact on York County, 850 York counties filed damage claims. 1,125 horses taken out of the county, 60 mules. 271,688.97 in personal property loans. You ever want to read these damage claims? They're on the website of the York County History Center. I transcribed them, donated my Excel master file to the York County History Center. But boy, the implications of the Confederate raid on York County are still being felt today. Today, still going on. Several farmers are bankrupted. I know families in York County that are still bitter at Drew Borley and Jeff Stewart. Why? Because they've lived in poverty for five generations. Some of them still live on the same farms. They've never had their wealth back that they had before the Civil War. And they're deeply resentful of that. John Mumper, Dillsburg, dies of a heart attack, right? And what Confederates come into his orchard, he has developed the, uh, we talked about the York Imperial Apple, he's developed his own apple called the uh, Mumper Vanderveer Apple, the second famous apple out of York County. Rebels burn down his trees for firewood. They eat all of his uh, apples. He dies of a heart attack. You know where the Horn Farm is out in eastern York County? The guy who lives there goes in the barn and kills himself because he's bankrupt. He hangs himself in that barn that burned down a few years ago. And of course, the most telling thing in York County is the people who supported the Confederates, the people who supported the Unionists don't like each other. And also that to you, 160 years later, some of that still lingers, where there are folks who supported Lincoln, there are folks who didn't support Lincoln, and families still don't like each other uh, in some areas. But it's a horrible time. It's a time that one York resident says never to be forgotten, never to be forgotten. And I'll submit to you, as a society, we can't forget. We need to remember how important this area was, remember our history, Remember the terror that once spread through York County. On behalf of my publisher, Sabbath Speedy LLC, I want to thank members of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society. Thank you, York County History Center, uh, for your kindness. And thank you so much, everybody who's attended today's presentation. Have a great day. Time for a couple of questions. Yes. Um, Major Gilmore in 64, he was in Timonium County. Yep. Did York County take out over that? Yes. In 1864, there was a Confederate raid called the uh, Gilmore uh, Johnson raid uh, that went uh, along the route of the Western Maryland Railroad. They were heading towards uh, Point Lookout to free Confederate prisoners of war. At the same time, the Confederate Army, Jim Early, now commanding a big chunk of the Army, comes towards York County. They're going to fight a battle in Monocacy. U.S. government does not respond by sending troops to Pennsylvania. They're going to send troops to Maryland at a point in time. 600 York Countyans grab their own guns, form an impromptu infantry regiment, and they march to the Maryland border. York Countyans, not with uniforms, just guns and guts, and they're going down to protect York County in case somebody comes up the railroad from here. So yeah, that, that was in response to the Johnson Gilmore raid. Exactly. They figured they're gonna shoot some horse and then if they could try to come close, they never do, but at least. But it just shows again, 1862, panic in New York because the rebels get within six miles of Gettysburg. They plan to burn the bridge in 1862. 1863, they do come into Pennsylvania. 1864, they come back. Yeah, I mean, we live on the border for three straight summers. York, Adams, Franklin County, definitely were worried about Confederates. Great question, Bill. Anyone else? Yes? How valid is the story about the note that was handed to ah. the little? It's yeah, backstory on that. Uh, little girl, Gordon, in various talks, says 10 to 12 years old, supposedly hands John Gordon her bouquet of red roses somewhere right out here on West Market Street and gives him, when he looks at this bouquet of flowers, he finds a piece of paper in it. 
unfolds it, and he says as a complete defense is the rights bill with names, number of troops, where they are, etc. He says when he got to Wrightsville that he went up on a high hill somewhere. You know, some people think he went up to Samuel Lewis Park. I'm not sure he went that far, but he went somewhere where he could see Wrightsville. And he says, not a, as I quote, not a detail of that little note was incorrect. Basically says everything the spy said was there. Do I believe John Gordon's story? Yeah, kind of, because uh, research by the York County History Center's late and lamented uh, Lila Foreman Shaw uh, over the years revealed the name of the girl, Mary Ann Small, lived right down the street here, uh, was not part of the small family that ran the town. Uh, she was yet another branch of the small family. Uh, but yeah, so I think it happened, sure. I, mean, I will tell you, John Gordon has a history of exaggerating. Uh, doesn't always tell the truth in all of his writings, but that's when I tend to believe. I mean, why would you make that up? That, that, doesn't, that doesn't make him feel much better. In fact, if anything, the reason I believe it, to answer your question, the reason I believe it, you're a military officer, you got the complete plans of the enemy forces, and you dawdle at Wrightsville for an hour before you launch an attack. You know, if you don't have that note, why do you tell people you do? Because it makes him look stupid. I got this note and it took me an hour to still take the town. You know, you're not gonna make something like that up. You know, he's gonna say, I had the note. You know, he probably shouldn't have told people he had the note because stories, military stories to this day will tell you that John Gordon dragged his feet at Gettysburg, dragged his feet at right school. You know, he's just dawdling throughout this campaign. But yeah, I think it was real. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Um, to whom did the militia units report? Were they reported to the Adjutant General? Ah, good question. To whom did the uh, militia units report? They reported directly to the Department of the Susquehanna, General Couch. So Darius Couch uh, is the commander of all the state militia. And so he reports to the U.S. War Department in Washington, to Henry Alex, who is the uh, U.S. Uh, commander in chief, general in chief. Now, they have a dotted line relationship to Governor Curtin and the Adjutant General of Pennsylvania because these are state militia paid for by Pennsylvania, but the final say goes to General Couch. But there is this twin relationship, hard line to Washington, dotted line to Harrisburg. Well, this, I have a degree for asking this yeah. question. I have ancestors who supposedly helped dig trenches out in Bedford County. Yeah. To protect against the Confederate and Jacob Sinks guys. What? Jacob Sinks yeah. guys. Well, I think the Colonel Turton's Jacob Higgins. Oh, very good. Yeah. And, Higgins was um, out there too. Yeah. The chicken raiders. That supposedly nobody knows the name of these civilians to help the trenches. Right. I'm trying to find if there'd be any documentation. Ah, uh, great question. And, uh the home guard units never reported to anybody. They reported to the mayors and city councils of the towns. Uh, Higgins' men were never mustered into the Union Army, nor were Jacob Zinks, who was the next one over. So there, there are no muster rolls for them. Uh, they never got pay. They never got uniforms uh, from them. They were home guardsmen. Uh, as such, any roles would have been kept by the communities in which they're raised. Uh, I don't think we even here in York County had the names of the guys who were here to defend New York. The guys were out there running around with rooms. We just know there were 100 guys with rooms running around there. We don't know what the names were. I get, I, well, what I'm, what I'm hoping is that somebody may have submitted a list of names to, right. to the uh, Commissary General in Harrisburg to get rid of it. For, 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 for pay, uniforms? Yeah, for, for, yeah. Which some of that records may exist. I don't I mean, you would know better in Harrisburg if, if there's such things exist. But I've never seen a possibility. I guess. Yeah, it's possible. I've never seen it. Okay. I mean, I do, I, I do know a few lists. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania actually did publish the names of some of the guys who were home guards. They're in a book by Samuel uh, Bates uh, called History of the Pennsylvania Volunteers, and he does have lists of some of the men. Uh, you can look that up. It might be in there. Okay. I'll look it up for you. If I think about it, I'll send you a note. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Are you aware of any documentation that may exist regarding um, the capture of prominent citizens such as Fairfield? Uh, and those people mm -hmm. served as uh, 
prison right. course for the prison prisoner exchange program. Correct. Is there any supporting documentation? Yes. Have an ancestor that was taken mm -hmm. care of ill. Yeah, there's plenty of documentation. I wrote a two volumes, a co-wrote a two volume set of books called If We're Striking for Pennsylvania. Uh, I document a lot of that in there. Uh, if you were a United States government employee, for instance, a postal postal guy, you were live bait. Uh, in 1862, Jeb Stewart had kidnapped almost all of the federal workers in Franklin County. Took them all. Uh, in the Gettysburg campaign, the postmaster at Gettysburg flees to York. We have an account of him at the bridge in York uh, with the postal bags from Gettysburg. Why? Because he's running away. We have six individuals in Gettysburg that I know of that are kidnapped, one of whom dies after coming back to Gettysburg, his health is broken. He's one of the Kadori farms. The Kadori farm, uh, Gettysburg, Mr. Kadori, Nicholas Kadori dies after coming back because his health's been broken in a Confederate prisoner war camp. This was civilians, folks. So yeah, it absolutely happened. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're also taking blacks. More than 125 blacks are taken out of uh, Franklin County. Here in York County, there's only one documented African-American who's kidnapped by Jew of Laurel, which is one. Ten-year-old boy taken off the streets of York, dragged to Castle of Thunder in Richmond after the Gettysburg campaign, is seen there by a visitor from York, uh, spots him, writes about it. It's the only account we have of him, and the kid's never seen or heard of from again. There are no accounts of him. We have, we have uh, war communication mm -hmm. letters that's survived over the years. Ring ancestor ended up at Libby. Oh wow! Yeah, a lot of a lot of officers, in particular, that were living. A lot of the soldiers in the eighty seventh Pennsylvania from York County that were captured in Second Winchester. About half the regiment, more than half the regiment, was captured. End up in Andersonville, and several York Countyans lie in Andersonville um, as prisoners who died there in eighteen sixty four and five. So, time for one more question. Tell us about the cannons and the pickets. Oh, yeah. That is a, a Civil War monument along 462. It's in Wrightsville between 3rd Street and 4th Street, uh, right at 3rd, I guess. Uh, and on the other side of the cannons, on, on the Helm Street side, is a plaque that de de uh, denotes Wrightsville as, quote unquote, the farthest east the Confederate Army got in the Gettysburg campaign. Actually, it says in the Civil War. That's not quite correct. But it is during the Gettysburg campaign. Wrightsville is the farthest east the veteran got. That was erected in 1916, 18 time frame. Uh, more than 5,000 people crowded into Wrightsville for the ceremony. It was big news back in the day. Today, cars just whiz by and nobody stops to read it. That's what it is. Kind yeah, of cool. And there's also some other monuments and stuff in and around Wrightsville. That's the main marker to the battle of rights. Well, thanks again, everybody. Appreciate your time. Have a great day. If anybody's interested in my books, they're in the back. Go see my handsome grandson. And he'll, he'll be on. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks again, guys. I will go hey, hey, carefully hey, through here without trampling. I love it. Thank you.